Okay. So I uh, just want to welcome everybody to the, uh, the May edition of uh, Innovation Insights. Um, I'm not sorry, not the May edition, the, <laughs> the July edition. It seems months uh, dragged together here. Just uh, and, uh, make sure I get it here. Yeah. Uh, just to set the stage, what is this? It's our monthly webinar series featuring mainly new, new technologies and products from our industry members and core partners. So we try to have one small company, one large company, and one research partner on uh, presenting. And then any I member of good standing is eligible to present. So reach out to me if uh, you want to get on the schedule. So just a bit out of IACME, you know, we're, we're organized around the three themes of convene, connect, and catalyze, bring people together, um, hook them up to each other to, uh, to be able to find solutions, and then, and then create new products and technologies to advance the composites market. There's a lot of offering in that. Um, we have facilities at scale, number of resources, uh, and various models from uh, modeling simulation up to full-scale molding, uh, talent development in, in, in the scope of um, interns and other workforce development activities. You know, we like to think of ourselves as a connected community. And uh, for those of you that are IACME members who have been around for a while, you know, certainly understand and appreciate that. And we're looking forward to uh, gathering again in person when uh, October comes at the uh, IACME members meeting. So today's uh, presenters will be Jeff DeGrange from Impossible Objects, Matthew Pays from Dasso Systems, and then Tom Margraf from Hawthorne Composites in conjunction with Ryan Seifert from UDRI. So with that, uh, Jeff, uh, we'll uh, stop sharing and uh, you can get going. Very good. All righty. Can everybody see that? Looks good. Okay, well, hello everybody, nice to meet you. Um, I'm with Impossible Objects. It's a small technology company of about 40 employees based in Chicago. And we actually have this new additive composite techniques, a manufacturing technique that I'm going to uh, tell you uh, how it competes uh, I'm doing low cost thermoplastic composite parts. And First, I'm going to kind of start at a macro level and then go down to a micro level. I think all of us on our on the call today probably know these numbers better than me, but based from a number of different sources out there, the whole um, thermoplastic composite market is expected to be about $35 billion in 2025. And when you really kind of uh, do a, a, a drill down of that, it's what's really going to drive those uh, that growth. And it looks like it's going to be mainly due to the transportation sector, which all of us in the IACME community, that's been a key area of focus for, for many of it, if not all of us. And then um, the aerospace and defense. And hopefully we'll start to see the uh, aerospace, the commercial aerospace side uh, start to recover as uh, things return to somewhat normal in the future. So if you kind of then continue to peel back this onion and look at the different types of uh, manufacturing, uh, composite manufacturing processes, uh, over 50% of what's uh, being built as far as thermoplastic composites right now is what's going to be classified as either through um, closed mold tooling, um, such as sheet molding compounds, and open mold uh, tooling is, is the bulk of it. And you can see the other different processes here that, that's used to make composite parts. So now I'm starting to kind of go into, okay, we know that there's a, and this is not all inclusive by any means, but I just wanted to let you know that if you look at thermoplastic composite parts, um, there's a number of kind of mainstream tech, uh, conventional technologies. Those happen to be compression molding, injection molding, the composite layup tool that we're all familiar with. Um, but what you may not be familiar with is the seven different uh, families of additive manufacturing. And the one that I'm going to focus on from Impossible Object happens to fall into the ASTM category of called sheet lamination. And I'll get into that too in a moment. But 
one of the things I just wanted to highlight, again, uh, I know who I'm talking with here. When you look at the conventional processes, you know, you have to have the non-recurring design and tooling expense for the discrete parts. Some of the different processes require numerous job classifications, certainly with the composite layup, you have different job classifications that get involved there. Um, sometimes you get multiple process steps. And then depending on which your manufacturing process, you have uh, part build uh, geometry limitations. So here's the, uh, what we call composite based additive manufacturing CBAM for short. And this is the uh, technology that up in the left, uh, left hand corner here. Uh, this is the what we do at Impossible Object is basically um, we've got a patent portfolio around um, the CBAM technology here. And that's the equipment that we sell uh, <clears throat> on the open market. And basically there's three there's there's three fundamental process processes on how this this works. Um, it basically leverages 2D printing. Um, rather than printing on a piece of sheet, we're using long fiber um, substrates. Uh, and basically, we'll, we'll print an image from your CAD slice file onto that fiber sheet. We then uh, run that under kind of a, a waterfall of uh, thermoplastic powder. And, and also, we're working with thermal set powders as well. And then we vacuum off and blow off the excess powder. This is all done at room, at room temperature, so there's no thermal effects on the matrix material. Uh, we stack all these sheets up. We're printing anywhere from two to three sheets uh, a minute. We stack all these sheets up. The second step, it goes into a, a heated 30-ton uh, press, take it to the melt point of the matrix, and then basically consolidate uh, the fiber sheets together to form your thermoplastic parts. The third and final step is that the build blocks taken out of the heated press and it's basically put into a um, bead blast cabinet where we're using a soft abrasive to break away the unused fibers to get to your final finished part, as you see there. So that's basically um, the whole additive process known as CBAM. Now the, the two the two main build material types used in the CBAM process is fiber substrates. And these are non-woven veils with a random dispersion fiber lengths anywhere from uh, a half inch to um, one inch uh, fiber lengths. Um, we're primarily working with a pan carbon fiber uh, veil as well as um, fiber, fiberglass sheets is from a fiber substrate. The actual uh, matrix materials the ones that uh, we have commercialized to date is the Peak and the, the Nylon 12, and uh, we do have Nylon 6 and, and Thermal Set uh, pretty far in, in development. But the key thing here is when you're doing certain types of composite parts, these fiber substrates and powder matrix materials are all stored at room temperature and used at room temperature. So you don't have to worry about the cold storage, the amount of out time, and the potential limited uh, use life on some of your materials. Uh, and so that's a, that's a real benefit of, of, of having that type of uh, process. So um, step one, I'm gonna do kind of a deep dive here into uh, a couple of these steps on the additive process here to, is to show that when we actually, uh, in, in that third image um, from your left, after we deposit on the powder, uh, matrix material, uh, we vacuum it off. As I mentioned, we vacuum it off and blow it off. And so there's very little waste. It's all done at room temperature. And so um, big benefit of doing this all at room temperature. Um, all, all of the excess um, matrix materials removed and cycled, recycled for future build. And so it's nearly 100% reuse of the unused um, matrix materials um, making it for minimal waste on the matrix side. <clears throat> so once we actually form the parts and you take the build block out of the actual heated press uh, and we remove the um, excess fibers, there's basically three, um, three different kind of um, potential, um, um, what I'm gonna, so when we actually slit this, this is a sheet fed uh, system. Um, and we basically will convert um, the non-woven veils uh, from a roll or web into uh, fiber sheets. Uh, current 
build sheet sizes are 12 inches. And so we actually have some excess material that comes off the slitting process. And that's what we're gonna call the carbon, uh, carbon strips. Um, then when you take the, the build block to the media cabinet and actually do the breakout, there's big chunks that come off and we're gonna call those kind of the carbon clumps. And then um, the last one is basically, whoops. And then the last one is what we're gonna call the carbon chop. That's basically uh, kind of mixed with the, the media uh, of removing the part. And so we've sent um, the, the strips, the clumps and the clops and the chops to, uh, we had, a, I have a project going with Endeavor Composites in the University of Tennessee, Knoxville lab at looking at these three different classifications and to what level they can be recycled. And there's a belief that certainly the carbon strips and the carbon clumps uh, can likely be um, recycled as long as it's maybe added with some, maybe some virgin or longer fiber materials to be reconstituted into uh, um, future feedstock. Um, just wanted to give you kind of a scenario of additive and, and you know, this is just, I'm not going to go into the details here, but, you know, these are different build layouts of mechanical linkages and pillars and gears uh, used with uh, different uh, build materials. And one of the things here is this total process time. Remember, there's three steps in this additive process. And uh, this is total process time to print, to heat and consolidate, and then to remove the parts. And uh, you can see the part cost depending on what uh, matrix material that you use. So it gives you a lot of flexibility to, man uh, to, to manufacturing, whether you want to do serial production or you want to do kind of builds with a, a mix, a, a, a nice product mix. But it's a, uh, additive technologies in general, and certainly IO falls in this, this thing. It gives you the ability to, to do cost effectively low to mid volume manufacturing for serial uh, for cereal or um, large product mix of uh, variations. Um, this was an interesting slide that, you know, as I was putting this to the, this presentation together, and this comes from, from Formlabs, which is basically, basically another additive technology company. But, you know, for, for all of us, this, this is pretty intuitive too, but it basically shows that, you know, depending on what kind of part volumes you need, do you, can you go with additive, which is basically a toolless process, or do you want to go more to some of your traditional uh, manufacturing technologies? And this is mainly around um, plastics and, and some of the, the thermal plastics, which are doing, uh, dealing with some of the shorter fibers when you get into uh, injection molding and some of the conventional molding processes here. But, you, you know, overall, I think that if your, your volumes are, are low, um, typically 10,000 pieces and below. I think additive is going to win on, on the cost curve there. And certainly getting uh, products to time to market, depending on one industry is, is absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely essential. But if you're doing kind of a long-term uh, high production run, in many cases, you may wanna to go to a, a tool process in order to get uh, the unit cost that you desire there. And um, this is kind of my last chart. Um, you know, what I wanted to say here is that when you compare uh, additive manufacturing to some of the other conventional manufacturing techniques from, and this is basically kind of looking at various types of information uh, out on the web and kind of consolidating that. Again, you know, we could probably have debates on, you know, um, some, of the, some of these different categories. But when, when you look at uh, part geometry complexity, you know, that's one of the things that added to manufacturing has really excelled in is it can actually um, make complex geometries uh, with pretty much ease. Um, and, you know, certainly you can get that with some of the RTM processes. So when you look at part, part complexity, additive is certainly going to be one of your, your top processes there. When you look at material flexibility, now again, I'm focusing more on the uh, IO process because we have a lot of different material combinations we haven't even begun to scratch the surface on, but a lot of material flexibility in, in producing thermal set and thermal plastic composite parts. And you, know, you also have that flexibility with the RTM process. Tooling costs. Uh, you know, basically you don't have any tooling costs with additive manufacturing. We are depending on the other processes. Um, those tooling costs can be quite expensive with long lead times. Going over to labor cost, 
Um, what you can see there is typically, you know, additive manufacturing, you have a technician that basically will download the file, start the machine, and then do, down, do the downstream post-processing. And typically, um, that's a technician job classification. And so typically, it doesn't involve a lot of uh, other uh, job classifications. So your labor costs are typically um, lower with, with an additive process. You know, when you look at quality and, and uh, part quality and size potential, I think um, certainly, um, you know, the layup processes are probably going to be the preferred choices there. Um, but all the other processes are pretty much equal. And then the, uh, then the last one that I'll, uh, I'll mention is material waste. We all know that um, all of these different manufacturing processes have different types of material waste. And the big question is, is to what level can they be recycled? And, uh, you know, um, certainly the IO process um, um, does pretty good to there. I think the very best one out there is, uh, is injection molding. But then, you know, with injection molding, though, you're getting into the shorter fiber lengths with, uh, in, into that process. And so with that, I think I'm holding this to schedule here, Dale. <clears throat> That's all I had. Right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I got a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, what's what kind of build tolerance do you have? You know, with this process, to, you know, what, you know, yeah. what, so, what, what, what's your typical tolerance? Uh, well, kind of level of detail. Yeah. So, so let's just say we go to maximum envelope build of say slightly under 12 inches. 12 inches by 12 inches by say four or five inches as far as XYZ. Uh, you're probably looking at between five thousandths to ten thousandths of an inch overall tolerance based on what we've seen in to date. Okay. And um, you know, how do the properties compare to other additive manufacturing processes, such well, as you know, the you know, FDM or a um, um, powder bed? So compared to other additive processes, I we have depending on what process and depending on what parameter sets, because you can do factory default, you can do custom parameter sets. But in general, uh, compared to other additive, what I'm going to call composite additive that might have shorter fibers in the materials, um, we're stronger. And just going to depend, in, in, in some cases, significantly stronger because of the longer fiber lengths. When you compare us to traditional manufacturing, a conventional composite layups with the unidirectional fiber uh, sheets or the woven sheets, you know, the, the fiber volume contents like 60% there. Uh, we're mm -hmm. about 25% fiber volume content. So we're not going to be anywhere as strong as a conventional composite layup. Yeah, well, again, but you're comparing, I'm just asking compared to other, other AM types of processes. Yeah, so so we're stronger and, and, and in many cases we're, uh, faster far as the overall unit volume compared to extrusion processes, powder bed processes, things of that type. Yeah. Okay. One last question and we'll move on to the next speaker is, uh, are the costs that you show for minimum quantity print runs, like, you know, is, are those for, you know, a few at a time, sheet at a time, you know, when, when you show, like when you showed the diagrams that had the, the mix of, yep. uh, you know, you know, so this is like, if you're almost doing one offs or a few at a time, those costs. Yeah, so that would be basically for doing a low volume run in if you own the equipment. That would be okay. what what your part cost would be. All right. All right. Thanks, Jeff. All righty. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we'll move on to our, our next speaker. It was uh, Matt Pays from uh, Dasso Systems. Matt, are you ready to load up and let's go? Hey, you can hear me and see my screen? Yes, sir. Perfect. So uh, thank you everyone for your time today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our solution for simulation design, simulation driven design of composites within the 3D experience platform. So I'll start off with just a brief introduction to Dasso Systems if you're not familiar with the company. You know, we are a, a purpose driven company. We're focused on, on science first and foremost. Uh, across the, the world, we have over 20,000 uh, people within the organization. We exist, you know, within 133 countries in many locations within those countries to make sure that we are close to all of our customers. We're able to help them provide value as they go about their, their product design activities. Uh, one thing that is unique about our organization is we are majority shareholder controlled. So even though we are a software company, we do take a bit more of a longer term view about our, our portfolio and our product development process. So we're not 
uh, as as worried about our, our quarter by quarter you know revenue figures as some of our our other uh, competition. We have a, a wide partner network that that helps us you know serve our almost 300,000 customers across the world and 26 million users. So you know we have a, a lot of scope and a lot of breadth that we uh, were able to provide. And one of the, the key areas there is composites. So uh, the, the little globe here that's kind of spinning will just kind of highlight some of the locations where we have facilities across the world. Our headquarters is in Paris and the US, our uh, regional headquarters is in Boston. And you see, you know, kind of the, the spread of, you know, field offices as well as R&D laboratories across the world. You know, our belief is, is really here that, you know, the virtual world, worlds extend and improve the real world. And that's really kind of uh, verified through our, our progression of technologies over many years. So if you go back to the, the 1980s when the company was founded, it was really focused purely on 3D design. Uh, in the late 80s, we moved more into a, a digital mock-up. So being able to, to take a bigger view of the product and collaborate on, on items such as the full scale of an airplane. In the 90s, we moved more into a, a product lifecycle management phase where we looked beyond just design and started to include collaboration techniques as well as manufacturing into the portfolio. Uh, we felt like at that point, we were really kind of hitting a, a limit to the amount of value we were able to provide to our, the industry uh, through a file-based approach. And so that was really the motivation to move to the 3D experience platform where we, we have a common data model and integrated tool set across all disciplines. And most recently, we've been uh, most interested in moving more into uh, the modeling of, of, of humans. Uh, one area that we uh, spent a lot of activity a few years ago was around creating a, a life, a, a realistic model of the human heart uh, so that you know, uh, different companies can look at different studies in terms of how you, different patients uh, may need different medical treatments to you know, deal with different issues that may be in place. Uh, we were also very core in, in the majority of the COVID trials, uh, vaccine trials that were done throughout the world. So I mentioned the 3D experience platform. You'll hear a bit more about it uh, subsequently. And so really this is the platform where we are bringing together all of our, our software in a single place and in a common data model. And this is especially important when we look at composites because it, it helps us to really accelerate the design of composite products when we have seamless integration from design to simulation to manufacturing. And you'll see some of that as we continue through the presentation. Before we do that, uh, I'm gonna kind of step through the, the process we see most often in industry currently. So you may start with kind of a CAD designer who does some initial surface design. Uh, at some point, he then maybe needs some help from an analyst to, to look at what's the initial sizing, where should different material be placed within that that surface design. Uh, the analyst and the CAD designer are most often using different tools. So data has to be transferred. There's a risk of data loss. Uh, really, it's just a very inefficient process to have to move data from one tool to another. Uh, that process continues with the analyst provides feedback back to the designer. Again, they're using different tools. So again, we have data translation. There's a risk of data loss, data being interpreted incorrectly. Uh, and that really just continues throughout the process. And then at some point we add in, you know, the manufacturing engineer. And again, we're, we're moving to perhaps a, a third or, or more tools in the, the chain here to try to go through a composite design process. And it, it's really just very inefficient. It's very time consuming. And, it's, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to design better composite products when you have a more integrated process where you're able to do more iterations and have more confidence in your design. And so that's really the, the challenge that the 3D experience platform was, was designed to, to handle, was bringing everyone together, sharing all the right data so that you can accelerate your design, have more confidence in the design as it evolves. And so when we, we look at the world of composite engineering in particular, the real strength of the 3D experience is the seamless integration between design, manufacturing, and simulation. And so all the data is shared between all the disciplines. So things like geometry, material properties, ply properties. And that really enables, you know, rapid iterations across all the disciplines. You know, what we've observed a lot uh, working with our, our customers 
is design and simulation where we're reasonably well connected, design and manufacturing, again, reasonably well connected, but manufacturing and simulation really were not connected. Uh, and that's really an area where we think there's a lot of uh, value to be had. So you'll see a little bit as we continue through the presentation about how we, we connect all the different disciplines together. And because we really have this seamless transfer of data between all the disciplines involved in composites engineering, we're able to assess more design alternatives and make sure that we're making informed decisions about our product as we go through the, the process. Uh, and we do have dedicated you know, technologies to support multiple manufacturing processes. You'll see a few of those highlighted throughout the slides. There's also gonna be additional ones uh, that we could speak to later. So what you see on the screen here is really that common data model that I mentioned for, for the 3D Experience platform. I'm gonna speak through this quickly. It's not really the core of what we're doing today, but it, it is informative about how data flows throughout the system. So we really start with requirements over on the left, which defines how is the product uh, going to perform? What does it need to do? From there, we have a seamless transition into really functional logical design, which would be more of a system engineering kind of view of the world uh, to make sure that we're taking those requirements and creating you know, actual implementable uh, features and functions on more of our, our physical architecture. Uh, once we have a, a physical design, we would then move into manufacturing to understand how we're going to actually build the product, how we're going to lay out our factory, how we're going to, to utilize all of our, our people to build the product. One of the things that is unique about the 3D Experience platform is simulation and test is really pervasive through all phases of the product development process. Uh, certainly the type of simulation changes if we're in maybe the physical realm, we might be looking at more of a finite element analysis kind of an approach. If we're more in the manufacturing realm, we're probably looking more at estimates for the, the throughput that we could get through a particular factory layout. But simulation and test is really core to making sure that the product that we're designing is going to meet all of the requirements. And so for, when we speak about composites engineering, we're really interested in the, the interaction between the physical manufacturing and simulation and test. And so what I'm gonna do on this slide is just kind of speak through at, at a relatively high level, the end-to-end -end, uh, solution that's available for different phases of conceptual design, or sorry, for composites design. Uh, the first phase is really you know, concept design. You have some, some reference layout geometry and maybe you need to understand where you need to place material to get you know, pretty, pretty much the kind of behavior that you're interested in. Uh, for this kind of uh, part of the process, we partner with Hypersizer, and they really feed in a lot of our initial sizing and optimization uh, solution directly into the design. Once we have that initial kind of sizing data, we can then start to perform sim some simulations. Uh, these are probably not going to be extremely detailed simulations. They're going to be looking at more overall you know, kind of uh, requirements. Are, are we having the right deflections? Are we having the right load transfer? things of that sort. As we mature our design, and we may start to do more uh, detailed kinds of analysis. So at this point, we're probably going to be really worried about things like composite failure, maybe delamination, debonding, if we're looking at kind of a, a hand layup kind of approach. Um, but again, we have all that connectivity between that detailed design data, as well as the, um, the simulation capabilities. So once we have, again, some more confidence in our design, we would probably start to do some preparation for manufacturing. Uh, this can take different forms. We'll speak of, about some of this later. Uh, for certain manufacturing processes, such as composites forming, simulation can be you know, extremely uh, relevant to make sure that we understand how to go about manufacturing uh, the, the product in a way that's going to be reliable, robust, and not lead to you know, unintended kind of heart defects and things of that sort. Uh, finally, we move into more of a, a pure manufacturing kind of uh, phase where we can do things such as looking at laser projections or you know, understanding how to, to feed data for automated composite uh, processes. So on this slide, I'm gonna speak a bit more about just composites. We're looking at more of a, a traditional layup approach. This is what we see still used most often in industry. And I just kind of wanted to talk through in a, a bit more detail the flow of information between design, manufacturing, and simulations for, for these type of approaches. 
So what we see most often would be you would start off with some some reference geometry uh, relative to your your initial design. Uh, that's going to really inform maybe the the way that you choose to separate your surface uh, into different grids and zones. And, and at this point, what we're really looking at is more the the kind of thicknesses that you may want to have in different regions. You're probably going to use a stacking sequence uh, where or maybe a thickness law so that you know roughly how many of each ply angle you're going to have in each of those zones, but maybe not the details about you know, exactly where the plies are in a, in a global sense at this point. Uh, at this point, again, we can start to perform some simulations. At this point, we're probably, again, more interested in stiffness KPIs, things like deflections, load transfer throughout the, the part. We may do several iterations back and forth between the design and the simulation. So we change our design, all we have to do is is rerun our simulation, we get new results. We don't need to go through and do any manual work like you might need to do with a file-based process. Uh, and at this point, again, we're, we're doing lots of iterations. We're looking at alternatives, doing some trade studies, understanding you know, the general behavior at, at the concept phase that is gonna be uh, ensure that we meet all of our product development requirements. Once we're satisfied, we then move into more of a, a detailed design phase where now we're actually designing the plies, we're defining where the ply layoffs, ply drop-offs are going to occur, uh, and doing a lot of the, the more detailed information. At this point, we could do simulation, but what we also could do is start to do some of our, our manufacturing preparation. This can take different forms. It could be uh, looking at you know creating some darts and things to that sort in terms of cut pieces. It could also be to look at producibility to understand how the actual part curvature may uh, influence you know the fiber orientations locally in different regions of the part so if you you look at the little animation here where we have the the radius you'll see some regions with yellow where we have a high amount of shear which kind of denotes that you know we're not going to have exactly the angles that we might expect to have and so one of the things that that's very powerful about the 3d experience platform is we can now do some detailed simulations for sort of uh, all the kind of refined kpis that you may need to assess things like you know, uh, strains, maybe again, we're looking at some debonding, things of that sort. We can pull all the information directly from the detailed design information, but also all of the, the more realistic, uh, you know, predictions about the aim as manufactured part in terms of all the, the slight variations that may occur because of the, the curvature of the part. And that really ensures that we're, we're performing the best highest quality simulation possible to make sure that our design is going to meet all the requirements. And that's really one of the phases that we see lacking in industry today is bringing together that manufacturing information to really simulate the as manufactured part. Uh, and it can have significant variation, you know, in terms of some of the, your ability to satisfy design requirements. So on this slide here, I just wanted to kind of highlight some additional, you know, manufacturing processes that, that we support in a similar fashion, kind of from an end-to-end -end process perspective. Uh, one is composites braiding. So we can go through the actual composites braiding process. I understand where we have different thickness variations on our final braided part, perform simulations on, on that part. Uh, and then on the right, you see uh, some of the animation here for a composite forming process. We have different levels of composite forming simulations. We have some very quick, fast running composite forming simulations to, to kind of get you close from a design perspective if you're more in the concept phase, all the way to very detailed simulations if you're more in a detailed design or manufacturing preparation phase. So just to kind of summarize, you know, the 3D experience platform, we have multiple manufacturing processes that we can support when it relates to composites engineering. Uh, the goal here is really to assess as many design alternatives as possible within the time allotted so that we can make the best informed decisions about our product development process. Uh, we do this through rapid iterations that are inclusive of all domains, which is really enabled by that, that shared data within the 3D experience platform between design, manufacturing, and simulation. So uh, thank you everyone for your time, and I would welcome any questions. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, the question for you is um, you know, how many of these simulations, for example, in the, the braiding and the, and the forming, you know, are inherent to DS and how many of, 
know, how, how well do you play or interact with, say, PAMFORM or other software that's out there? You know, can that be integrated into this, you know, or other FEA platforms? It's a good question. So if we, we speak just generally about FEA, uh, we have the, the best support for the Abacus Solver, which is a Dassault product. We also have very good interoperability with Nastran. Uh, for composite braiding, our, our integration is really to Abacus. When we look at composite forming, we partner with Convergent who provides some very valuable technology that supplements our ability to do the very detailed composite forming simulation. Okay, All right. thanks. We well, appreciate that. And um, you know, when I want to remind all the audience, you can continue to post questions in the, in the chat or in the Q&A and, and Matt will answer those. Or if you want to reach out to any of our speakers, just get a hold of me or send an email to iacmeevents at iacme.org and we can connect you up, so. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. Very informative. And uh, we'll move on to our next presenters. So, um, Tom, do you want to get started? Tom Margraf uh, yeah. from Hawthorne Composites. Yep. Thanks, Dale. Get this pulled up yeah. here. Can you confirm that you can see a single screen? It's a title chart. Yes, sir. We're good. Uh, Thanks, Dale. Uh, so this presentation today is a little bit different maybe than the last one. Uh, this, this is a presentation of phase one uh, AFRL STTR program results uh, for a program called Design and Manufacturing Techniques to Deliver Topology Optimized Composite Aero Structures. Uh, your two presenters today are myself, Tom Margraf, uh, president of Spintech Holdings. Um, if you're not familiar with Hawthorne Composites, uh, Spintech Holdings, other operating division is called Smart Tooling. Uh, Smart Tooling has been in the market for about the last 11 years, and just recently this year, we launched Hawthorne Composites. Uh, and then my co-presenter today is going to be Dr. Ryan Seifert, uh, University of Dayton Institute, research engineer. Um, Ryan, I'll give you a chance here if there's anything you want to add to your introduction before jumping into the program. No, not short and sweet. All right. A quick introduction into the program. Uh, we, we propose this work statement uh, in a response to a, a, a specific Agility Prime STTR topic. And the focus of the program was really to develop a technology methodology, both design and manufacturing, to replace traditionally manufactured core stiffened composites. Uh, so in cases of core stiffened composites where you've got a sandwich structure, those particular structures are not highly damage tolerant. Um, they're difficult to repair. They are in some cases difficult to manufacture and they're as well not low cost. So as we move towards the adoption of composites in the eVTOL market, we wanted to come up with a design and manufacturing methodology to replace uh, the conventional core stiffened composite structure with something that would be you know, equally or thereabouts equally lightweight, uh, good specific strength, easily repairable, low cost and increased damage tolerance. So when we looked at our portfolio of technologies between uh, Spintech and University of Dayton Research Institute, um, a couple of things jumped out that might enable this. Uh, UDRI's got a great capability with uh, topology optimization, which Ryan's going to talk a lot about today, and a technique called Taylor Fiber Placement, which Ryan's going to talk a lot about. Uh, from the Spintech side, we bring tooling methodology and infusion experience. Uh, so we looked at this these suite of technologies and said, if we bring topology optimization, and then the ability to manufacture those optimized geometries with Taylor fiber placement, and we pair that with novel tooling solutions and resin infusion, can we check all of these respective boxes? Again, relatively equal mechanical performance uh, for weight, uh, damage tolerant, uh, repairable, uh, and low cost. And so Ryan, I'll let you kind of jump in here and go through TO and, and uh, TFP and some of the early program results, and then I'll pick it back up and go through fabrication. All right, appreciate it. Um, like Tom said, I do a, a fair amount of composite analysis and design, uh, mostly in the topology optimization field. Um, here at UDRI, we have we have quite a few in-house softwares. Uh, we have stuff like VTMS, which is a pre and post processor specifically for uh, fibrous materials. 
Uh, we have BSAN, which is our in-house finite element solver that specifically caters to composite damage evolution um, and some of those more advanced mechanics. Uh, and then we have what I'm going to be focusing on today, which is, is fiber architecture and topology optimization that leverages uh, tailored fiber placement manufacturing. Uh, and, and the gist of this is, uh, it's pretty simple, right? Uh, carbon fiber composites or unidirectional composites are, are very mass efficient in the fiber axial direction. Um, but in that transverse direction, you're typically a, an order of magnitude or more and more compliant. Um, and, and typically this is this is alleviated right with your zero plus minus 45 90 type layups or your conventional layups or, or a sandwich structure that's got some face sheets. Um, but we have this this manufacturing method tailor fiber placement uh, that really can point fibers locally in preferential directions. So what we want to do is create some design algorithm that can then tell the, the machine okay we want the fibers to go in this direction in these locations uh, to create highly tailored designs for, for specific problems for, for higher specific stiffness essentially. So on the next slide. Uh, so this is our tailored fiber placement. Uh, we do a lot of this at the Dayton Composite Center uh, here in Dayton. I um, want to acknowledge ZSK who uh, works with us and provided the machine that's out there that that made a lot of the preforms that you'll see in these pictures. Um, so what tailored fiber placement sort of 101 is it's uh, almost analogous to FDM for the, the 3D printing type people, but you're laying down toes of, of fiber uh, to create a preform. That preform can then go into tooling and, and infusion that Tom will talk about later. Um, but this gives you quite a few advantages. Uh, the big one is, is it's very little waste. Uh, so instead of cutting out, say you want to make this ISO grid structure that's on the top right, uh, you don't have to cut those out of some face sheets and then lay them up and then, and then infuse them. Uh, you can stitch the toes down directly in the geometry that you'd like. Um, and then the one that I, I'm, again, harping on is, is the directional stiffness benefits of being able to, to steer your toes within the structure to create stiffness where you need it in different directions. Uh, really take advantage of how, how stiff these carbon fiber or, or whatever fibrous composite may be. Um, in the axial direction. Um, it also has some auxiliary benefits as well. Multi-material is really nice. You could change out what these fibers are in your structure and build up a multi-material structure if you want to do something like multi-physics uh, applications that we've looked at. Um, and also these stitches themselves, you can use some structural stitching to get uh, what's typically hard to do, which is z-directional uh, stiffness or strength increase. So some z-stitching as it's referred to for transverse properties. So on the next slide, just sort of introducing uh, what we're going to be sort of comparing to. Uh, Aurora identified this three core three construction with a, a quarter inch honeycomb uh, sandwiched between a couple face sheets uh, that had a total thickness of just over uh, 0.3 inches. And we wanted to design some composite structures that are gonna fit sort of in that envelope. So if they were gonna in theory go on a similar vehicle, they'd, they'd fit, the, uh, fit the design envelope. Uh, but use our algorithm to design some tailored fiber placement structures that we'll then go and manufacture to see sort of how we stack up. Uh, so to do that, the optimizer is a, it's a 2D plane stress finite element solver nested within a, a gradient-based optimization. So we create some representative 2D load cases here just to show off some of the capability. Uh, one's shear, so that might be analogous to drag, right? If you have a wing root cantilevered on one side and the, the drag is pushing the wing back, that, that panel might be in shear. Uh, and then compression, which is sort of analogous to lift. If this is on the top of a wing, uh, and the wing's lifting up, that puts the top wing or the top panel on the wing into compression. So we're going to look at these, run them through the optimizer, and see what sort of architectures and topologies uh, we might get out of them. So uh, on the right here, you'll see what's typically output uh, from the algorithm. You get this this sort of weight versus stiffness, right? Your your cost versus performance curve, right? Um, every one of those blue dots corresponds to some optimal fiber architecture with a different amount of, of tailored fiber placement on top of some fixed layer of, of face sheets, uh, just so that we have a closed out geometry, right? So if you're going to bolt this thing into a wing or attach it to a wing, it, it's got a, a solid backing for geometry. Um, but you can see here, we've normalized everything by that Kevlar. So that is that three core three uh, sandwich panel. So that has a weight of one and a normalized stiffness of one. Um, and then if you go up from that vertically uh, to that first blue dot there down in the bottom left, uh, you see for the same amount of weight of material, we're actually able to get uh, about 60% more stiffness. And this is in the shear load case. Uh, so for a single load case, we're able to, to improve the stiffness quite a bit for the same amount of weight. I um, mean, obviously as you, as you increase the amount of weight you have or material you have, uh, so going right on the x-axis, you're able to use more material and get higher stiffness. 
and you see the architecture actually changes pretty drastically as well. That that insert there is a 50% uh, weight uh, or fill fraction of tailored fiber placement material uh, all the way up to the top right uh, where you can compare if you were to just lay this thing up zero plus minus 45 effectively isotropic uh, but fully dense uh, you're about 50% stiffer even if you have a fully dense panel if you fill that panel in with locally tuned fiber alignment. So then on the next slide um, you can do this uh, obviously for multiple load cases like we said we had a shear and the compressive load case are now the x-axis here. We have our shear stiffness on the uh, y-axis. We have our compressive stiffness. Um, and now each of these color lines is a, a, a set of designs that are constant weight. So the yellow line, all those are the same amount of weight, purple line, so on and so on. Uh, and what's interesting is in the bottom left corner, again, this red line, all those designs are the same weight uh, as the Kevlar sandwich panel. Um, and you can see, actually, there is some load combination of shear and compression for which that Kevlar sandwich panel, which is that little black dot there, uh, sits right on our optimal surface, um, which is kind of a good sanity check, right? If everyone in the world is using sandwich panels for effectively uniform loading, there better be like a reason or a range for which it's optimal. And it shows that it is bang on the optimal line for one load case. But as soon as you get into some more directional loading, you really get the advantage of something like tailored fiber placement, where now your design envelope of achievable designs is for the 11 weight percent or the same weight as the, the Kevlar sandwich panel is that entire red line. Uh, so you could achieve much more with the same amount of mass. Uh, and, and the big thing with that is if you were to sort of envelop all of these lines um, and just fill that area in, those are all potentially attainable solutions using this method. Uh, so, for example, the, the engineer might come to you and say, I need a panel that has 80 shear stiffness and 100 compressive stiffness. And you can just go to this, this plot and draw that intersection. And you should be able to predict um, both about how much mass that's going to cost. And then you could actually set the optimization up to run that. And it'll tell you what the fiber architecture uh, should be. So then sort of what I wanted to... Uh, harp on with that is is for the same weight. So all five of these panels are the same weight. Um, they're drastically different panels, right? Um, they're very different architectures that we found uh, by changing how important compression is or how important shear is in the load case. Um, so by locally tailoring your fibers and creating these fiber architectures, you're able to use the same amount of material to do very different things, uh, which you typically can't do with some more conventional manufacturing methods. Um, and one joke I like to make a lot on, on these slides, uh, especially this one, is if you look at that top left uh, topology, which is all compression, I was like, well, we've we validated what the Romans knew like thousands of years ago, that an arch is a good structure in compression. So MATLAB is, is clever enough to replicate thousand year old results. But then you look at some of these mixed load cases and it's very unlikely that a, an engineer with a ton of intuition is even gonna be able to, to decide that some of these are your optimal fiber architectures, right? So it's really nice to have the topology optimization algorithm to come through and say, these are what the shapes need to be. And these are the angles of the fibers that need to be inside of those shapes to give you your best stiffness for a given set of loadings. So then we took this and we're, uh, we've been working on being able to pull results or meshes from things like Abacus, uh, which was mentioned earlier, um, and set those up and and bring those load cases in and run them in the optimization. So we looked at an actual wing panel. Um, go to the and go to the next slide. Um, and the way we initially did that was we took it and we ran it in 3D and we copied all the principal stresses or principal strains and, and uh, the strain field and tried to recreate that in 2D. Because um, again, this is a 2D optimization code, but we're actually in the process of now is, is interacting with uh, 3D finite element solvers. Uh, we have a mesh independent algorithm that can port between, we run in MATLAB, the optimization and, uh, and whatever input file you need to run in your specific finite element solver. So then we can do that, do the same thing. And again, this is the typical output that you get. Um, <laughs> um, but you see that this loading was actually pretty multi-directional or pretty uniformly in, in two directions to so the, the Kevlar sandwich panel, which is that bottom left X. 
uh, is actually a pretty good design, but we can still sort of outcompete it uh, by a little bit in this with the tailored fiber placement. And obviously, as the, the optimizer is allowed to use more material, so as that normalized weight goes up, uh, it has more to work with, right? So it can actually start aligning more fibers in more preferential directions that by the time you get all the way to the right on this uh, X axis, uh, that second X on the right is, again, if you were to just use zero plus minus 4590s uh, for the same weight, you could get a lot more uh, stiffness by using the tailored fiber placement panel. So Ryan, the next chart, we're gonna jump into fabrication. So before we do that, do you wanna kind of just talk about where we're gonna go, hopefully in the phase two on this program? I know yeah. we're gonna to touch on it here at the end, but that might tie a nice bow on the design work. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so like I mentioned a little bit earlier is we're, we're doing a lot of work with pulling, if, with actually using things like, like Abacus uh, as the analysis program uh, and wrapping this optimizer around it. Uh, so we're gonna, go out of just the 2D uh, plane stress into 3D shells. Uh, and we're looking at being able to apply this to to maybe even a whole wing um, where we're running, determining fiber angles and, and topologies within the within an entire wing structure. Um, so a lot of work going into that, um, but it, it's exciting stuff. And we're hoping that once we do that, when we're, what Tom will talk about is actually making these, uh, it'd be pretty neat to see a tailored fiber placement wing, so. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Yep. Um, so as Ryan was uh, doing all of that uh, development work that's way above my pay grade and my intelligence, we were over here just building simplistic things. Um, so on the fabrication side, because this was only a six-month program, we decided to build a simplistic demonstrator, which is called this 12 by 12 radial bands preform on the upper right hand image. And then late in the program, we actually were able to adopt one of the um, – optimized results, and that was the 25% uh, shear, 75% compression with a 25% uh, TFP infill. Uh, so the focus of this activity in the program was really to validate uh, what the TFP capabilities were, uh, you know, on its own accord, you know, what type of radius, what type of thickness can the TFP handle, um, as well as then once we did have an optimized result, can the TFP manufacture that? So in order to develop a method of manufacture, we conceived a couple different ideas. Uh, there was really three different things that we trialed, two of which were, I'd say, uh, highly successful, one of which was uh, difficult at best. Um, but using this radial bands preform, uh, we, we prototyped all three methods of manufacture. Uh, the first method of manufacture uses these discrete uh, silicone call inserts. Uh, as Ryan explained in the design portion of this, uh, these panels are two layers of Kiso heavy material from AMP Technologies, which is zero plus minus 60 material off the roll. And then those are stitched, the TFP preforms are stitched directly onto uh, the Kiso material in one case, and that builds up half the thickness. And then the other half of the thickness of the TFP insert is stitched onto uh, essentially a carbon scrim layer uh, that can be then cut out. And then the second layer of TFP is inserted on top of the first layer of TFP. Uh, so what you end up with is this, this peak and valley kind of construction um, where the peaks are the top of the TFP and then the valley is going to be that Kiso material. And in order to fill that or prevent resin from filling into there, uh, we filled that in this case with uh, water jet cut pieces of silicon insert. And the, the height of that silicon insert was nearly matched to the height of the double stack of TFP inserts. Uh, once the silicon inserts were in place, uh, the panel went under vacuum bag. There was some flow media put onto the panel to allow for flow assist. And then we actually Vardam infused the full dry fiber preform and did an oven only cure. Um, in this design, the Vardam was a good manufacturing approach. And we actually were able to use the exposed fiber in the TFP as some of our resin flow path for the resin during the infusion. Uh, so then looking at the results of the uh, infusion, and this is actually the first panel that was done. Uh, the, Silicone insert piece is shown here on the right, and those are the results of that. And then the other method of manufacture, which I apologize, I don't have more pictures of, um, actually used a fully contiguous silicone call sheet that dropped over the TFP preform. Um, so in that manufacturing approach, uh, we had an aluminum, uh, we'll say silicone call tool that was basically the inverse of the preform, and we're able to cast a silicone call sheet on that aluminum tool and then similar idea, uh, the, pre the TFP preform was constructed onto the Kiso. Um, in this case, the method of manufacture was actually representative of um, uh, resin film infusion. Uh, so we took the dry fiber, 
uh, poured resin onto the dry fiber, put the sandwich construction together, put the call on top of the silicone call on top of that, that went under vacuum bag and then actually went into the autoclave uh, for cure. Uh, so we had both a out of, uh, out of autoclave cure option and an in autoclave cure option as well. And so here you can see both panels side by side. And, you know, really, again, both panels had very good uh, initial results. And we've got a little bit of test data here to kind of look at that. Uh, so again, silicone insert and silicone call, two different panels. Um, interestingly enough, when we look at the fiber volume uh, for the silicone inserts, which was the oven only cure process, uh, we see about a 50% fiber volume, a little bit higher void content, um, about 2.8% void content. If we look at the silicone call sheet, we're at 49% fiber volumes, fairly similar in a 1.8% uh, void volume. So again, initial screening tests look like these are both viable manufacturing options. Um, and they'll have their different benefits for different types of geometries as well. Uh, we also screened out different radiuses for what the TFP machine could manufacture. Uh, so some of these have different radiuses and different geometries as well. Um, so then I don't, again, I apologize because we're running out of time here. I don't have images of the actual uh, branches panel, uh, but we did fabricate a branches panel as well and had very similar uh, initial screening results to these radial band uh, panels. Um, so ultimately, at the conclusion of our phase one here, um, we believe that we're well on our way to demonstrating a topology optimization uh, software solution uh, through UDRI uh, that's going to be able to design these uh, aerostructures away from the conventional sandwich uh, construction and move towards a TFP topology optimized construction. And then on the method of manufacture side, again, we believe that we're well on our way to developing a robust method of manufacture for both in autoclave and out of autoclave uh, solutions that are going to allow us to manufacture these components at a low price point. Um, so we just submitted our phase two proposal uh, with the Air Force, and we're hopeful to move into the phase two program um, late this year. So with that, we'll turn it over to any questions. Thanks, Tom. Um there was one question that came up and uh, asking about how big um, the panels could go that Ryan did uh, answer online. So if you go into the Q&A, you'll see that it was answered about how big you can go. Um, so, you know, because it's theoretically roll row construction, you could go pretty large, might need, still need some joining, especially if we do something like a Taylor fibered uh, wing scan or separate TFP pieces for interior ribs or spars. You know, so, you know, we are at the at the end of our hour. I think it would be kind of it will be kind of interesting to see where you go when you do a full wing. You know how you do the interfaces, for example, with uh, with spars or ribs. You know, I think it's a it offers real opportunity there to how how those kind of interlocks might might occur on that. Yeah, and Dale, that's a good comment. That's actually one of the focus areas of our phase two proposal was. You know, we're looking right now at just the skin construction and skin design and optimizing around that. But obviously a wing is a three-dimensional construction with spars and ribs. So, um, you know, this program team did not elect to pursue a total TFP three-dimensional construction. Uh, we're still optimizing the topology optimization in the skin plane. And then we're still going to use a conventional spar and rib construction for full assembly. Um, so how we interface into those is one of the focal areas of the phase two proposal. And how Sorry. that load transfers as well. Sure. Yep. It'll be very interesting to see where that goes. Okay. Uh, we're at the end of our hour. We want to respect everybody's time. Sure, other people have places to be. Our next uh, event will be on Monday, August 16th. And then we'll have another one on Tuesday, September 14th. And then we will pause the online webinar versions to, um, uh, to move to our members meeting in October, which will be live in Detroit. And we'll have a couple of innovation insights sessions during that members meeting in Detroit. So, so if you're planning to attend the members meeting in Detroit, you'll be able to see this um, you know, full on presentations in a, in a similar format. So I wanna thank all of you for attending today and uh, appreciate your time on a Monday. Please enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of the week.